There you go, there you go. Uh, I was thinking of the various things that take place, and I just wanted to say happy birthday to a special person. Some of you may not be aware of it, Susan O'Quinn's birthday was this week. So, happy birthday, Susan. I, I don't know where you are now, because I can't see it. It's just a white wagon up there. But thank you, Steve, for taking the service. And uh, as you can tell, I'm Bob Balatiri. I'm not Art Cyphers. And you can tell very readily, he says, I have hair. <laughs> Brother, brother, Art. What you <laughs> brother, brother Art tells me that all the time. He's brother, I'm so jealous of you. I said, you know, I said when I was a kid, I said even even as an adult, I had to have my hair thinned out every three weeks with thinning shears. One of the barbers actually didn't want to cut my hair. He said it's just too thick. So I'm just me, a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Amen. I thought to myself, Lord, what? What one thing do we need in church? Maybe most of all. Now, if you got with a bunch of preachers, they'd probably tell you, well, we need doctrinal purity. We need to make sure that the word is read exactly as the word is supposed to be, that it's preached the way it's supposed to be. And that's true. We do need doctrinal purity. Some other preachers might say, well, we need evangelism because the, the churches just aren't reaching out like they did in the old days. Now, we do need evangelism. We need people going out there. And, and I, I thought when we sang that song, Jesus is alive. You know where Jesus is alive today? In you and I. The world will never see Jesus unless it sees Jesus Christ in us. I watched Aretha Franklin's funeral this week. Now, I didn't watch the whole thing. I was told it went from 9.30 to 6 at night, from 9.30 in the morning. That, that's a bit long for a funeral, I think. But then I watched John McCain's funeral. And there was one overriding thing that took place. I was, I was really tickled when I saw the speakers that John McCain had. He had a football player spoken in his behalf. He had a couple of Democrats and he had a couple of Republicans. John was able to cross the barriers that we sometimes put up. You see... We're all different here today to some extent. My brother over there, he's black. Amen? Amen. I'm white. But we're one in Christ. Some of you are born and bred Southerners. You know, I hate to tell you, but I was born in the Flatbush area of Brooklyn, New York. And I hung out a lot in Hell's Kitchen where the Italians hung out. But I want you to know that I love you today. I mean that. And I have been privileged to be here for a couple of years now with Pastor Art. And I have got to say that man has showed me tremendous love. He really has. Is he perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. And guess what? You're not either. So what is this topic that we need to look at? Turn with me to John chapter 15 for a minute. John 15. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. One of the things we brought up in Sunday school this morning is that, you know, if you plant an orange tree, you don't want pineapples. You want oranges. Christians are supposed to produce godly fruit. 
And part of that godly fruit is other Christians. Then he says in verse 9, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The Ten Commandments are crucial to civilize mankind. We need rules to live by. We need, we need space and the, the boundaries and, and, and you know, such to live by. But notice as he goes further, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. And then look at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now we read that sometimes and we kind of gloss over it. Maybe we ought to spend a few minutes on it this morning. Jesus has not given us an option. He doesn't say pick and choose. You know, I, I, I find people who pick and choose out of the Bible. Well, I, I agree with this, but I don't agree with that. Or I like the New Testament, but I don't believe the Old Testament. I'm telling you folks, from cover to cover, from beginning to end, it is all God's Word. It is useful for everything in life. He says, this is my commandment. I, I, this is what I expect of you. This is what I want of you. This is what you should be doing. Love one another. And then he adds, as I have loved you. I don't know why Christ loved me. I was unlovely. I was rebellious. I remember when a minister came to me and, and with tears in his eyes said to me, Bob, do you realize that you're going to hell and Jesus never wanted that for you? And I jokingly, out of ignorance, laughed and said, me and my buddies will bust hell wide open. And yet he loved me. And I don't understand that. Why does God love you? Maybe you don't understand it either. Because we're not perfect people. And even though he loves me, I still mess up. Do you mess up sometimes? I use my wife a lot as an illustration because she's a very godly woman. I, I thank God for her. She's, as I said to the class, she's my balancer. She keeps me level. When I'm out here, bent out of shape, she has a way of just bringing me back. I don't know how God does it through her, but he, but he does. But God loves me. And God wants me to love you. And he wants you to love others as he loves you. I wrote down, love is an incredible force. And I thought of mothers. How many mothers here today have done without sleep to take care of a sick baby? Amen? Amen. You, you've done without a new dress or a new blouse or something because your kids needed something. Amen? Amen. I can't tell you. We raised 10 kids. I, I don't know when the last time my wife has been to have her nails done or to have her hair cut. Because there's always a child somewhere that needs something else. Mothers are like that. You know why? Because they love their children. I used to think that all mothers did. I, I thought there was a gene in women. Call it a mother gene if you want. I thought there was a mother gene in all women. But I realized that I was a little mistaken on that. There are some women who just maybe would be better off not having kids. But, but for the most part, ladies, and I'm praising you, this is not a, a reverse compliment, most women exude love for children. What about dads? I've worked as many as three jobs at one time. 
I worked in some jobs I didn't like, but I worked there anyway. And I worked extra hours and I worked overtime. When I was in the post office, I worked 60 hours a week there. On my day off, I would work with Alberta's father on a truck, loading, loading trucks. Why? Because I loved my family and I wanted to provide for them the best I could. And so the Bible says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Some people are even willing to go to their deaths to save someone else. And that's exactly what Jesus did out of love for you and I. Though we, we relish that, we delight in that, that God loves us and that God willingly gave himself for us. But we're told in the Bible to have that same type of sacrificial love. Now, I admit, I don't know all of you. And there are some of you that I feel closer to than others. And I hope I don't embarrass some of you today, but you know, I really, really, really love Meg and Tommy Miller. They exude Christ to me. I've never, ever heard them say anything bad about someone. They are gracious. Another one like that is Dale, over here. And there are many of you like that. Now, I'm not trying to exclude anybody. But we're to love that way, sacrificial. It's almost impossible sometimes. You know, there are, there are some people, would you agree with this? There are some people that are hard to love. Amen or whatever. Some folks make it difficult. I've shared with you before the deacon I had. I had a deacon years ago who just griped all the time. He just didn't want to be around his brother. I mean, everything was gripe about this, gripe about the church, gripe about the lawn, gripe about the service went too long or the service was too short. And so finally, you know, when I get in situations like that, I realize, Lord, I can't rely on my own wisdom. I have to rely on you. So I go, his name was Elmore. I'm going to tell you his last name. He's since gone on to be with the Lord. But his name was Elmore. So I go to Elmore's house. His wife was a lovely woman. And she put up with this cantankerous character. And I go in and he's griping. And I, I don't know what came over me. All I can say is I, I said to myself, Lord, help me. Let me give this guy a shock treatment. <laughs> so I kneel in front of him as I do many times. And I held his hand on his lap. And I said, Brother Elmore, let me pray for you. And he had just spent 15 minutes griping about his wife, the church, the lawn, and the trash cans, and you name it. And I don't know where it came from, but I, something like, Lord, my brother is so unhappy with this life. Lord, if it's your will, just call him home right now. And, and he starts to shake, and I go, oh, 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 Bob, you did it now. You gave the man a heart attack. Thank God for that. He lived a few more years. I don't want to lay that on my, on my conscience. But he said, I'm a preacher. It ain't that bad. I think, you know, even, even the Elmores, they need love. Seems impossible sometimes with some folks, doesn't it? But realize this. This is a command. He says in verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He said, I'm not asking you to pick and choose. This is not an option. This is, this is the 11th commandment, if you want to call it that. Love one another. You say, Lord, it's impossible. But you know, God never calls you to do something that he doesn't equip you for. It. You know that? God will never call you to do something that he doesn't give you the ability to do it if you what? Lean on him. There are 
are times when I don't feel like preaching. <laughs> I hate to say that, but there are times, and I'm not up here to please me. And you know, I'm not up here to please you either. I'm up here to please him. That's who I have to please. That's who I have to answer to. And so to understand how important it is to love like that, I want you to turn with me just for a few minutes to 1 Corinthians 13. And 1 Corinthians 13 is affectionately known as the love chapter of the Bible. And Paul stresses there the preeminence of love. And look at verses 1 through 3. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So love transcends all those spiritual gifts. The ability to communicate, the ability to preach, the ability to share your faith, the ability to, have, to, to teach a Sunday school class or to be a professor in a Bible college, those are good. But love surpasses it. Bible knowledge and understanding, great faith, Even sacrificial giving, and lo and behold, in verse 3, even martyrdom. They are all great qualities, but the greatest is love. My day to pick on you, brother. I, I have known you for 25, no, more, longer than that. I've known you for almost 30 years. 30 years I have known this brother. And he has loved me and loved me and loved me. Skin color doesn't matter. Background doesn't matter. Finances don't matter. He just loved me. You see, without love, all those other things are worthless in God's eyes. So the type of love that Paul is speaking of here, there are three types of love. This is agape love, by the way, agape love. In the Greek language, there are three different words that are translated love in the English. And eros love is that sexual love that a man has for a woman. And phileo is used for friendly affection. It's where we get the, the name for the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But agape is that unselfish, giving love, sacrificial love that Christ had for us. And he's saying, love each other like I loved you. And notice this. It's being committed to another person's well-being, no matter what. It's wanting what's best for them, their security and their best interest. It's not dependent on that person's lovability or how happy they make you. One of the things you see with divorce today is that people get married and they promise they, they love each other and they promise to stay together forever and then all of a sudden, one person doesn't feel that he or she is getting an equal dose of whatever there is to give. I'm just not happy with you anymore. You, you, don't, you don't please me. Or, you know, your looks have changed. Maybe you married a skinny mini and now she's not quite so skinny anymore. Or maybe you like a more hefty woman and you married a hefty one and now she's so what? It's in here that what counts. It really is. I have said to my wife over and over, honey, I don't care what you weigh. I don't care what you wear. Well, I, I, you care. Please understand what I'm saying here. But what I care about is the heart, the personality, the lady inside. Affection. In 
The only way to love as Christ commands us to is to let his love flow through us. Now, fortunately, we have an edge. And the edge is the Holy Spirit. I hope you realize that every single one of you that is born again by the Spirit of Christ, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides in you, travels with you, helps you speak, helps you think, helps you love. You have an edge. You're not like the world because you're Christians. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, Paul uses some character traits and actions to describe love. Let's take a look at those for a minute. We're to live in such a way that God's love flows through us. And look at verses 4 through 7. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not, uh, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. There are at least four things I see there. So what does that type of love look like? First off, and I wrote it down in verse 4, love is Consider it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't demand its own way. Sometimes my wife and I get into a, a spot. We so much want to please each other. <laughs> She'll say, what do you want for supper, honey? And I'll go back, well, what would you like? And she'll say, well, I asked you first. You ever have that happen with husbands and wives? You know, neither one wants to make the choice because you want to please the other. I'm not, I'm not fussy. I'll eat almost anything except for liver. Don't ever, don't ever feed me liver because I'm not going to eat it. I never will forget, Brother WB, you'll appreciate this. When I was a chaplain, I took the gentleman out to a funeral. His father had passed. And I took him to the house, and his mother and was there, and all the other folks. And being the minister that I was taking her son out of prison and bringing him there to, so he could share the meal and be with his, with his folks, she fixed me a huge plate. And bear in mind, guys, now I am from Brooklyn, New York. I had never seen greens in my life until <laughs> I came down south. In fact, I didn't know what grits were. I thought grits was like farina and you put sugar and, and milk on it and you ate it for cereal. But this dear lady comes out and I swear it looked like a platter, not a dish, but a platter. She had a heap of fried chicken and about two and a half pounds of greens. And she said, thank you preacher for bringing my son out that he could be here and we just fix this for you. Now what do you do? You don't want to hurt the lady's feelings. I had never eaten it before, and it really didn't appeal to me. I ate every last bite. <laughs> because that's what you do. <laughs> it's just what you do. Love is considerate. You see, we're, we're imperfect people, and we live in an imperfect world. And I saw this so clearly with myself only a couple of weeks ago, and I'm not going to mention a name, but... Apparently, I did something to offend somebody in church. And I didn't even realize it. But about four or five days passed, and that person came to me and said, Preacher, I forgive you. And you know what I said? Boy, I'm embarrassed. I said, I don't need your forgiveness. Where did that come from? Why couldn't I be gracious and just say thank you? Or I appreciate that. Or, or give that person a hug and say, God bless you. But you know, we're imperfect and the devil is going to rear his ugly head wherever he can. 
I had to go back a couple of days later. I went home and God just beat me to a pole. I mean, I got in my prayer closet in my bedroom and God said, you need to make amends, my friend. You got out of bounds. And I went back to that image and I said, please forgive me. I don't know what came over me. I am so sorry. And that person did. And we're okay today. You see, love, real love that's considerate, is willing to, to put up with the annoying traits and the behaviors that other people have. We're all different. We all march to a different tune. <laughs> I had this, this Italian uncle. His name was Emil Bassone. We called him Lefty. And Lefty had a, a cute phrase he used. And as a little kid, I thought it was Italian. See, I, 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 my mother was Irish, so I never spoke Italian. I, do, I love Italian food, but I can't speak a word of the language. And, and every now and then, Lefty would take his fingers, and he's, Bobby, two inches on, two inches on. And he would say it fast like that. And I never knew what he was saying. And finally, I realized I got, he's saying to each his own. I thought it was some fancy Italian word I was learning. Was <laughs> that, you know? Love's considerate. Love considers. We don't worry about the annoying traits. And then look at verses 4 and 5. Second thing is love is unselfish. He lists actions and he lists attitudes that flow from a selfish heart. And they're not compatible with Christian love. Jealousy, arrogance, unbecoming, crude behavior, seeking one's own rights, easy provoked to anger, holding grudges, being unforgiving, and the list goes on and on. And God doesn't want us like that. When you think of Jesus hanging on a cross, mocked, humiliated, dying for the, your sins and mine, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Every one of those in verses 4 and 5 are, are, are just rooted in selfishness and, and self-importance, thinking that you're so, so important that, you know, really what it is, you're being controlled by self, you're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's the bottom line. Every single one of you here today who names the name of Christ could be the very best Christian this world has ever seen if you submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The problem is we don't. We don't. We do it kind of episodically. I've had highs and lows. And sometimes I've, 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 done, I've accomplished things in, in my life. I thought, how in the world did I do that? And I realized, I didn't do it. Christ did. That's, that's why I've accomplished. I mean, you know, speaking in front of people. I failed public speaking in college. I froze. I couldn't do it. And God says, you'll do it for me because I'll speak through you. Just open your mouth. You just be a mouthpiece. And I'll say what needs to be said. And thirdly, genuine love is discerning. Verse 6, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. I wrote this down. Our world has redefined love as showing acceptance and support for others' choice of behavior. But that's not at all how God's word describes love. When you affirm someone's sinful behavior, then you're not doing what's best for them. I have that with my children. We've had 10 kids. My kids live in perfect lives because they had an imperfect father. But sometimes when I see their behavior and I know it's wrong, even though it, it may ostracize me from them for a while, you know, it's pretty bad when you're a dad and your daughter unfriends you on Facebook. But I've been unfriended on Facebook twice by, by two different daughters. Now, fortunately, we're friends again. Because I can't see them committing sin and sit there quietly and ignore it. I love them no matter what. But I'm not going to agree with sin. Amen. Discernment. And fourth, godly love endures. 
in a day when people are quick to give up relationships because they become difficult. Biblical love stands firm. Alberta and I talk sometimes about getting old. Nobody wants to get old. Of course, when you're, you know, when, when you're 16, you want to be 18. And when you're 18, you want to be 21. But you know, when you're my age, the joy has left that area. I don't, I don't want to think of another birthday. I'd like to say what I am now. But endurance, love endures. Verse 7, it bears, it believes, it hopes, it endures all things. It suffers hardships. It suffers troubles, bears up under injustice, refuses to delight in gossip about the sins of others. No matter how bad circumstances may look, agape love is grounded by faith and rooted in hope. I can't even begin to number the times I've let God down. I've been a Christian 45 years. I don't know. But I do know one thing. With all the junk I've been involved in and all the sins I've committed, whether commission or omission, God still loves me. I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Because the Bible tells me so. God is not willing that any should perish. There's not a single person here today. I don't care what you're involved in. I don't care where you come from. Jesus Christ loves you. And he wants the best for you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, you say, Man, Brother Bob, it's just so difficult to love like that. In your own strength, Yes. What Paul is describing there is a person whose life is totally surrendered to Christ. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And for these folks, their hope is not in getting what they want, but in being what God wants them to be. I thought back over the years, and I thought, why did I go into ministry? I I've never made a big salary. I, I've never been the head of the convention. I've never been the dean emeritus of a seminary. I was a mailman. Loved it. Enjoyed being outside. Enjoyed the people I did with them. I knew them by heart. Their names and their dogs and their pets. And their... I loved it. And I could have retired at 55 years of age. And God says, but I want something else for you. And I thought, oh no, not me. I can't do that. He said, you're right, you can. So just, just give up right now, just quit, and just turn yourself over to me, and I'll make you what I want. And when I did that, doors began to open. I served as a youth pastor. I served as an assistant pastor. I served as a pastor. I served as a, as a, a seminary, seminary teacher. And I thought, Lord, where did all this come from? from me. I'll accomplish in you what I want accomplished if you just sit back and say, here I am, Lord. Use me. That's it. Right there. But too many of you are not willing to give up your money or your prestige or your, prestige, your position. You want to go ahead and kind of play the game. God says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another sacrificially, honestly, no restraints. And sometimes I say we get the process turned around. We, we, we try so hard to love others, but we keep failing because agape is a fruit of the Spirit, and we're not allowing the Spirit to run our lives. God produces the fruit as we obey Him as we surrender in obedience. And like branches bearing fruit, we simply put on a display as his life flows through us. So I challenge you this Labor Day weekend. Let 
God have his way with you. He will accomplish more in you that is lasting than you will ever accomplish in yourself. Let God use your talents. God gave you a personality. God gave you things that you particularly like to do. God gave you abilities that he can use. Let go and let God. Can you do that this morning? Brother Steve, 